What does a franchise CEO have to say about how business is run today? Today, we find out on Start With A Win. Welcome to Start With A Win, where we unpack franchising, leadership, and business growth. Let's go. And coming to you from Start With A Win headquarters at Area 15 Ventures, it's Adam Contos with Start With A Win. Today, we have Peter Holt. Peter has been managing franchise systems in both domestic and international markets for over 30 years. He's currently the CEO of the Joint Corporation, the largest franchise network of chiropractic clinics in the world, get this, with over 900 clinics nationwide. The Joint is a publicly traded company on NASDAQ. Peter, I feel you, man. I've been a public company CEO <laughs> too. Peter, welcome to Start With The Wins. Good to see you, my friend. Hey, Adam, pleasure to be here. Awesome. Hey, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, a little bit about myself is that I started franchising uh, actually 37 years ago on staff at the International Franchise Association. And that I had just finished my master's in Latin American history from the University of London. Uh, I had come back from London to Washington, D.C., because if you're going to do policy analysis of U.S. Latin American relations, and that's what I wanted to do, you, where would you go? You'd go to Washington. And just through a funny series of coincidences, I got hired by the International Franchise Association. And at the time, I was assistant director of development. Uh, the only thing I knew about franchising at that point was that McDonald's is a franchise, and I'm not really particular about that food. And I knew even less what a trade association did. And that in that process, my job was to run around and recruit franchisors to join the association and to make sure that they rejoined you know, every year. And so in that process, I absolutely felt in love with the business model of franchising. And so here we are 37 years later, <laughs> I just can't get out of it. It's just too interesting. Wow, and give us a little flyover of the joint. Tell us about the joint. The joint, in, in many ways, it's a very, very classical story about startup franchisors in the United States and kind of the, the, the challenges that they have to face to, to survive and thrive. That the joint got started in 1999 by a doctor who had this brilliant idea. He was in Tucson, Arizona, that he truly wanted to bring chiropractic care to the masses. And at the time, this is in 99, that chiropractic care was kind of behind the curtain. It was in, in office buildings, medical facilities, not easily accessed. And his vision was, you know, I'm going to make it affordable. I'm going to make it in a retail setting. I'm going to make it without insurance. I'm going to make it without an appointment. There'd be art on the wall. There'd be music. And what so often happens when that franchisor, when that entrepreneur has this really great idea, he opens up the door and it was unbelievably successful. And so you have these patients or customers coming in and saying, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And what so often happens is those same customers say, this is so interesting. Are you franchised? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so uh, our doctor said, you know what? Why not? And so in go. 2003, he started franchising. Now, he had a great concept and he was very, very good as a doctor. He was a lousy franchisor. And what he did not understand, which so often happens with these young entrepreneurs, is they don't understand the difference between concept and methodology. And as a franchisor, you are managing two parallel, unrelated businesses. It could be frozen yogurt, postal and business and communication services, chiropractic care. There's over 300 industries that are utilizing the methodology of franchising. And so without him taking the time to understand methodology, the challenges that he faced was that he was not really structuring the business appropriately. And so he had a great idea, but was really unable to execute it as a franchisor. Now, coincidentally, uh, these two brothers saw one of his franchise units operating in Austin, Texas in 2010 and said, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And so they ended up talking with the doctor. They bought the concept. It was actually in bankruptcy at the time. And that when the joint core formed, which is a company I'm working for, this is in March of 2010, there were eight franchisees that came into the system. So 99, 2010, eight. <laughs> wow. You and I both know that's not franchising. No, no, that's not profitable either. So, no. so <clears throat> to say the least. And so then uh, <laughs> these brothers hired a professional CEO, actually uh, the, the founder of Massage MB. He had retired and sold to private equity, asked him to come in as CEO. He did. And so when we went public in November of 2014, we had 242 systems on, in the ground, on the ground. That's franchising. 
So in less That's than four right. years, we go from eight to 242, we went public, and then we haven't looked back since. So today we're with over 900 units and continuing to grow. Great. Great. Yeah. You, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the kind of the dichotomy in franchising and for our listeners that are new to franchising, you have franchisee, which is one of the franchise units, you know, you drive through a strip mall and you see a million of them. Um, and then you have the franchisor, which is the headquarters company, which is what Peter is the CEO of. So that, that company itself sells franchises, opens franchises, with franchisees. Right. And you, you mentioned the, the two, you know, the two words in franchising, um, you know, the concept of, of franchising and then really the, the system of the particular franchise itself. Uh, give us a quick flyover of the dichotomy of those two things and how they are different in operating business. Well, what's so interesting to me, Adam, is it's, it's, it's they're actually agnostic to each other. They're unrelated. Right. And, and, and that's, that's exactly why franchising can be a methodology that applies across these 300 different industries, because it's not industry specific. Now, we know that franchising is more engaged in the retail sector than in, in let's say, B2B and other, other, other venues. But that's, it's, not, it's not stopped it from utilizing almost any form of business development has been able to utilize the methodology of, of franchising. And so what makes it so interesting is that, and, and we talked about, I've spent most of my career in what I'm going to call the small box retail. So what are we talking about? It's that strip mall. It's the anchored by the supermarket. It's that thousand square feet. It's where you get a haircut, buy a frozen yogurt, now get chiropractic care. And it's a very unique space. And, and, that there's a, and it's really important to understand that space if you want to be effectively managing your business in that space. And so for me, when I drive around, all I see is these little boxes, you know, and these little boxes all have the same cost. They've got the same landlord. They've got the same rent. They have the same potential customer base because it's only the people who live, work and travel in that five to 15 minute radius around that box that are going to open that door when they want that product or service. And so there's just some really interesting attributes that apply cross concepts. So whether it is frozen yogurt, whether it's chiropractic care, whether it is postal and business and communication services, how are you transferring the technology of your operating model to that franchisee? How are you generating leads or customers? Because you all have the same customer base. So what are the methodologies that you're using to make that customer aware that you're there when they need that product or service? And what we do know in that small box retail space, the most powerful tool that we have to educate that consumer about your product or service is storefronts. Right. Now, if you think about it, every single brand you know that has been in that small box retail space has utilized the methodology of franchising to grow, except for one. As far as I'm aware of in that real small box retail space, there is one company that has not used franchising, that's Starbucks. Right. And they've had they've had their own path and, and obviously been very successful at it. But the vast majority of us, whether it's, you know, Jimmy John's, Subway's, haagen Ben and Jerry's, you pick the, you know, the joint, you pick that concept and you will find that it was built on the model of a franchise. Peter, so when you look at what causes successful franchisees and, and how they start growing their businesses, because that's what we want is successful franchisees. What is your opinion on that? How can, how can our franchisees, how can anybody who wants to be a small business owner as a franchisee out there um, find some sort of success in this methodology? Absolutely. And that's what's really important to understand, Adam, is that franchising is not a guarantee to success. Franchising is simply a methodology to grow a business. So if the business itself is not sound, franchising won't help it. You know? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so that's why you really have to focus as a franchise or what I've learned in all these years is that you must stay focused on the unit economics of the business. Because if you are focused on that and you're getting that right and you have a concept that's not a fad, it's a trend, then you're able to continue, continue to, to serve your customer base and that customer base, you'll evolve as your customer base evolves, then you have a fighting chance to make this work. And what I've also learned, so first of all, concept has to be you know, sound is that because you uh, methodology does not change that. Secondly, is that what I've learned in all these years is that one of the most important things to understand is the roles and responsibilities between the franchisor and the franchisee. Now, what I've learned is there's absolutely nothing intuitive about being a franchisee. 
So just because somebody paid me a franchise fee, signed the franchise agreement, do they know how to be a franchisee? Do they know what they're supposed to be doing? Of course not. We have to teach them. And if you don't know what their role is, then how do you teach them what it is? Just as the franchisor has a fundamental role and boy, you better understand it and boy, you better play it. And you allow, you tell your franchisees, this is my role. This is what you're going to hold me accountable to. This is your role. And I'm going to hold you accountable to that role. And so what I've learned over the years is the more effectively that you can make sure that all parties understand the roles and responsibilities of being a franchisee and being a franchisor is one of the most powerful tools you have to make sure that that concept is going to be successful because otherwise you're, you're managing all of these mismanaged expectations. So if that franchisee came in thinking, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to pay you this big fee. I'm going to sign this agreement. You're going to do my marketing. You're going to do my operations. You're going to do my IT. You, you know, I'll just sit back and collect the cash. Now, is that, <laughs> is that how it works? Nope. That's <laughs> not how it works. No. And, and I, I talk all the time. And again, most of my experience has been in retail. And, I, and when I'm talking to prospective franchisees, I'm saying, now let's get this straight. Retail is a lot of work that you're oh, dealing yeah. with customers, you're dealing with landlords, you're dealing with, with employees, you're dealing with all kinds of things. And boy, you have to be able to put the work in. And so if you're not looking to do that kind of work to build a business, because it's hard to build a business, whether it's a franchise business or an independent business, it's hard. Now, we do know that you have a better chance of succeeding historically on that franchise model, because if you really think about franchising, Adam, I have so many different ways I talk about it. You know what franchising really is? It's the business of selling mistakes. Oh, there you Oh, I love that. The business <laughs> of selling of mistakes. What are we doing here? We're creating an operating model. Well, how do we create that operating model? Well, we do things and it's like, oh, that doesn't work. I'll never do that again. Right. Ooh, that's working. That's interesting. <laughs> we're going to put more of that into the model and we're going to continue to revolve and evolve and evolve and evolve and evolve. And that operating model ultimately just gets better and better and better, both by what the franchisor is trying to do to support it and to enhance it, but more importantly, from the franchisee's perspective. I talk to our franchisees all the time. I do a franchising, you know, opening class for all of our new franchisees. And it's this, you know, two hour presentation I do. And I, and I, at the one point I say to them, okay, now listen, I want you to write this down. This is really, really important. And so, and so I can, you know, I'm saying, okay, I'm watching them. They're careful. The CEO's telling them, okay, write this down. We're going to write it down. And so I say, okay, now listen, write this down. Every idea that a franchisee has is not a good one. Now write that down. And they're like, oh, no, that's not right. And so I say, okay, no, wait, let me give you the corollary that the best ideas come from our franchisees. And totally. that's, that's that dynamic tension. That's, that's that capacity of the franchisor to be working effectively with the franchisees, managing that relationship so that you can hear those new ideas, those new plans. Those, I mean, they're, the clo they're on the line dealing with the customer every day. And that gives them, and that gives them a, a perspective that's hard to have when you're sitting in the puzzle palace and trying to figure it all out. Now, we have a portfolio of corporate units, so we do get a lot of that same online direct information. But who has it? It's my employees. Now, do employees tell you about what's going wrong at the clinic level or why this should be different? Few. Most of them, you know, when they get frustrated, what do they do? They quit. <laughs> yep. You never yeah. see them again. Well, a franchisee can't quit. And right. so they have to come to you and say, listen, you need to listen to me. This is important. And if you're effectively managing that relationship, you're hearing what you need to, to continually make sure you're keeping your concept relevant to the consumer that you're serving. And your franchises this is a, are doing that for you. This is an amazing point, Peter. And, and thank you for bringing it up because you're absolutely right. The best ideas come from the field, but not all the ideas that come from the field are good ideas. And I mean, it, it's... It's something that you and I have both lived being a franchisor as well as, I mean, we're a franchisee here also at Area 15 Ventures and multiple different brands. But ultimately, it's, it's here's proof of concept, folks. If you're listening to this, there are, here are three proofs of concept that the best ideas come from the field. The Big Mac, the filet of fish sandwich, and also the, uh, what is it, the, the breakfast um, Egg McMuffin. Egg McMuffin. Those three... Those three things come from the field at McDonald's. And Adam, there's and, so many other examples of that. And, and there's, oh, and, totally. And it's structural. This is what's so interesting to me. It's structural in the relationship. So let's say you're big box retail. And so you're sitting there and you're, 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 you're on the floor, you're selling the dresses and you know that, 
that you, 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 you are talking to your customer every day and they say, you know what, we hate these blue dresses. They're crazy. Don't, why, why are you trying to pitch them? So what is that, that lowest paid employee in that, in that big box retail goes to his manager and says, hey, nobody likes the blue dresses. So what does the manager say to that employee? Sell the blue dresses or I'm going to fire you. <laughs> right. And, and so, I mean, that's, that's the relationship. And so in that franchise model, that franchisee is not the lowest paid employee to the business, that they are somebody who has invested a significant portion of their life savings to use this brand and use that operating model. And so a no is not a no. And so absolutely, it is in that push, 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 push. And so and, and, and as long as you are effectively managing that incredibly important relationship between the franchisee and the franchisor so that you are listening to what's being told to you now, not all things are worth listening to. Right. But but the, but all the important stuff is there. Totally. And is. So then your job as a yep. franchisor is to make sure that you're hearing that. And believe me, your franchise is going to make sure you hear it. I've never had a problem with franchisees making sure that they are heard. And that's right. They, they have to. It's called vested interest. And that's what's so yep. interesting, again, about the franchise model itself is by creating that vested interest. And that's simple. You put a significant portion of your life savings on the line. You get a level of engagement that you will not get in any other form of business development. And well, that is the power of the franchise model. Totally. I mean, you're, you're 100 percent right, Peter. And I mean, you we've both lived it for so long. We, we know the proof of concept in this idea. Let me let's take this one layer down because um, and, and I want to ask you about this. This is really important to me. Franchises are community. And all of our franchises exist within our local communities. And that franchise owner, that franchisee is part of the community. How does that impact the growth of the business? And what is the part of the franchisee to go out and become part of the community to, to create, um, you know, public interest and consumer interest yeah. and things like that, and actually bring customers in the door to ring the register. How, how does being part of the community impact that business? Adam, growth? you are touching one of the things I, I again, stress so hard in, in that same franchise se seminar that I do for our new franchisees. I go through a whole series of kind of my personal definition of franchising. And one of those elements is exactly what you just said. Franchising is the business of community. And especially in that small box retail space, because and I tell them, I say, listen, if you don't listen to anything that I'm saying in this presentation, you need to focus on this point because that you're in small box retail. You will have a series of the only people who will come to your clinic, will live, work and travel in that five to 15 minute radius around that box. And 15 minutes is a long time. And so your success is going to be a direct relationship to your capacity to anchor yourself into the community that you're serving, whether it's, you know, the sign thrower, whether it's the coupon drop, whether it's the outreach to the schools or the gym or whatever your concept is, is that joining the Better Business Bureau, making sure that you're online today with all your social media, because that's where so many of our customers are today. And so it's those direct activities that you focus on so that when that person is going through that daily use center, I'm like, oh, there's the joint. That's not cannabis. That's chiropractic. I'll try it. <laughs> and and so I tell them that, that you, and it's so interesting to me too. And I've had this concept. I've talked this a lot is especially again in that small box retail space. So the young franchisor, they're really excited. They built it out. They want to save cash, right? They've got to be really, I mean, it's, it's, they got to get to break even. And so we, in our contract, for example, our contract requires them to spend a minimum of $3,000 a month in those local store marketing activities. Yep. Now, so many young franchisors, what do they do? They may have the same language in the agreement because we all kind of have the same model we're working with. And do they enforce it? Nope. No, they don't. And so what's happening here? And this is what I would say to that young franchisee. Listen, you are going to spend it no matter what. You're going to spend it on labor. You're going to spend it on your rent because you don't have enough revenue to co cover it. So your goal is to get to break even as quickly as possible. So if you can take that spend up front and make sure that you're minimizing the time it gets you to break even, you're going to spend it. There's no point in saving now. This is when you've got this amazing moment to do your grand opening and then your ongoing spend because we're not Procter & Gamble here. I don't have $75 million to get you to change your toothpaste. 
what I have is that little box with your storefront. And we know that storefront is the most powerful tool we have to educate the consumer about your concept or service. And that's so right. that's why it's so important to, to make that spend. Because, and, and it's in the very, now this is talking about the model of small box retail. And, and so it doesn't matter whether it's franchising or not. I and mean, what the power of franchising is now all of a sudden you, you can leverage that spend. So for example, when we have a whole series of clinics in a market, we'll form a co-op. And so all of a sudden they're not just spending $3,000 on sign throwing or whatever else is that they are now doing TV, they're doing radio. And this is to me, one of the most interesting things that's changed in my career is in, in the early years, you, when you say TV, I mean, there were three stations to work with. And if you didn't have a national footprint, you couldn't even talk about a, 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 a TV program. Well, today you, you can literally target the individual subscriber to whatever, whatever they're watching, whether it's Hula or um, uh, cable or whatever else, or YouTube videos or what. I mean, so all of a sudden you can do TV in a way you never could have done years ago. And so collectively those clinics, those 30 clinics all in the same area can now contribute to this this fund and do things they never could have done otherwise. Now we're leveraging the power of the model. That's and it. So that's, that's so interesting. That's it. I mean, that, that word leverage is so powerful when it comes to franchise growth and small business growth. Leverage is the one thing that small business owners, independent small business owners that are not franchise affiliated and are not part of a network, that's what they're missing is that leverage to create scale. And, you know, there's power in numbers. There's power in your network and I, I think that's that's one of the last questions I want to ask you, Peter, is, um, you know, people ask you, what is the value of being part of a franchise network? It, we want to be part of a network. Why? Because there's more brain power. There's more different ideas. There's more trial and error. There's more spending leverage. Tell us about the value of a good network. Well, and, and Adam, you just touched on all that, but there's something else you didn't mention, which is even most important, and especially for that small, independent entrepreneur. And, and let's talk about chiropractic for a minute. You know, chiropractic is a $20 billion industry. It is one of the most highly fragmented industries I've ever seen. There's 41,000 independent practitioners that are making up that for $20 billion business. Now, in addition to all the value of leveraging your, your advertising, learning from each other, just think, imagine you have 900 units out there all doing the same thing. You don't think we can learn from each other? Another way I talk about franchising is franchising is the business of accelerated learning because you don't have to make the mistakes. And so as a franchisor, we're going out there, we're constantly looking at the best ideas, things that are working, whether it's operations, IT, whatever it is, bringing it back into the network, rolling it out so everybody can benefit from it. All boats rise. Now, let's talk about that, that little independent practitioner, that chiropractor. He's working so hard. He's doing his own marketing. He's built up this very successful business. He's dedicated his career to it. Now he's ready to retire. He want, for whatever else, whatever reason he wants to monetize that investment. What's it worth? What's it worth? Not much. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's not much. There's no goodwill associated with this. What does he have? He has a small box. He has a little bit of equipment. In our case, it's an adjustment table and a computer. And that he has no goodwill associated with that. He has a, he has a patient list. Now, instead of it being, you know, Dr. Holt's chiropractic care, is it's the, as the joint, now there's goodwill associated with that so he can monetize that investment. And so, for example, again, we're a public company. Last year, we had four high-performing clinics in the, in the Phoenix Scottsdale market that we paid $5.6 million for. Because wow. we, we, we have a portfolio of our, of our own corporate units. We, we, create, we build from the ground up. We also acquire them from our existing franchisees. But so that's goodwill. And so, I'm, and I talked to some of these independent practitioners, I'm saying, look at what happens at the end of your, your, your life cycle. Where, what do you think happens? How do you and retire? Is, well, <laughs> right? well, exactly. And this is, this is the power of the franchise model, because again, you may have the best hamburger concept in the, in the world and it's right next to McDonald's. And let's say the sales are exactly the same. Who's going to get the premium when that concept goes up for sale? The yep. one that has goodwill. Because That's this it. is what we're doing is not just creating 900 wonderful, highly running clinics that are doing a fantastic job of providing chiropractic care to this nation. What we're doing is building an asset and that asset has value. And that's why you participate in a franchise model. 
That's it. That's exactly right. I mean, you want proof of concept, just go to biz buy sell and, and look at what small businesses are actually able to sell for if they're just by themselves. I've, I have a friend going through that right now and they're kind of like, well, nobody knows our brand outside of the two blocks around it. Exactly. And it's I mean, good, the word is goodwill. It, it is absolutely. So Peter, this has been fascinating digging into franchising with one of the top CEOs in the franchise space. Uh, I mean, you've, you've shared a lot of great information with us, but I have one final question I want to ask you that I ask all the great leaders on this show. And that's how do you start your day with a win to create these successes? It's such a great question because in the end of the day, what you know, Adam, is that what are we doing? We're problem solvers. Every day I go in the office and I have a whole new set of problems, smaller and bigger, that I have to address or work through my staff to address. I mean, nobody has ever hired me and said, you know, hey, Peter, come on board. Everything's perfect here. We're just trying to, you know, we're to pad our payroll. (laughs) They, They hired me because there are problems and they believe that I could help solve them. There you and go. so for me, I'm a very early riser. I get up usually every morning at five o'clock. I was up at five this morning. I work out with a trainer usually two or three times a week. And so, I, and, and I could do it by myself, but uh, it, it's so easy to say, you know, it's, I'm kind of tired this morning and, and you know, I, I'll work out tomorrow or I'll work out later. So it gives me a discipline. And so I'm out there working with my trainer two or three times a week. In between, I, I used to be a big runner. So I, I was, I've done a bunch of marathons, qualified for Boston and and ran Boston, which was an amazing experience. And But now I'm doing more biking. And so what, what happens is every morning I start out by physically taking care of myself. And, it, and so no matter what happens through the rest of the day, I did something of, I did something that helped me. So I could go through the worst day I can, that you can imagine. And believe me, I've had them. And that I, I can at least take comfort in that, well, yeah, I got my workout in. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. Taking care of my body. And and then and, and taking care of my body, that puts me in a better space to be able to deal with all the challenges that I'm going to face every day I go to the office. That's right. I mean, what a great way to start your day, folks. Um, and I just, I put out a video called your first meeting of the day, and it's your meeting, which is your meeting with yourself to get yourself going every single day. Uh, I encourage everybody to run over to YouTube. It's just a short 20, 30 seconds. But Peter's right. I mean, this is a key business leader talking to you about how to start your day with a win. And he has a great start. And that's with himself and the accountability of making himself better. So Peter Holt, CEO of the Joint Chiropractic, over 900 units franchised. Make sure you check them out at uh, thejointchiropractic.com, I think it is, or thejoint.com. It's it's thejoint.com. TheJoint.com, awesome, awesome, and they are a publicly traded company. You can uh, find them in all your uh, your Wall Street research. Uh, Peter Holt, thank you so much for being on Start With a Win, and thanks for all that you do. Absolutely, Adam. Thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with you.